I'm absolutely delighted to be here speaking to you. I've been told not to go behind these black spots, so you can yell out to me if I do. Um, and I don't usually read from a script, but it seemed to me that it, this was a big enough um, occasion to do that, uh, at least for a little bit. Um, and I wanted to talk about, um, firstly, my beloved parents. And this is them on their wedding day, on the 2nd of November, 1939. The date probably means something to you. Um, they, along with everyone else, ran away to get married the minute the war started. Um, they both had dementia. Um, Dad had vascular dementia, and Mum had Alzheimer's. Um, Dad became demented overnight. Uh, he had a massive stroke. Uh, he was actually on his way to the shops, um, and people thought he'd fallen over the curb, but he hadn't. He'd had a stroke, uh, and he never really had a coherent thought again. Uh, but Mum had Alzheimer's, and her mind fragmented over a, um, a number of years, actually. And dementia, in all its forms, is a cruel disease. Uh, my parents were educated, intelligent people. They loved life, and they lived it to the full. Uh, but they died unable to recognize their children, unable to communicate, doubly incontinent, and helpless. And I looked after them for 13 years. And for Dad, that involved looking after his money and his property on behalf of both him and Mum, and looking after Mum as she looked after his other needs. And Mum was diagnosed with dementia, um, with Alzheimer's, the year before Dad died. And after that, she came to live with me. And that's Mum when she was 17. And she looks like Catherine Zeta-Jones, doesn't she? I think she does, anyway. And that's Mum when she was 83, um, shortly after she came to live with me. And she lived with me for five years, and she went into a care home, which I know is not something that you do here, six months before her death, because I just couldn't cope anymore. Um, while she lived with me for the five years, I coped with all her most intimate needs. And I had some truly dreadful moments uh, during the years I cared for my parents. But I don't regret a single moment of it. I loved my parents, and it was a privilege to care for them. And it's love that I want to talk to you about tonight. Um, and that's because although there are huge differences between the UK and the UAE when it comes to caring uh, for the carers of those with dementia, love is what you and I have in common. And actually, we have a lot of things in common, but love is at the root of them all. When my parents were diagnosed with dementia, I felt despair, terror, guilt, fear, anger, and all the things you would feel, or perhaps have felt, in the same situation. And of course, it might not be your parents. It might be your spouse who's diagnosed, an aunt or an uncle, a sibling or even a friend. I'm going to talk about parents because that's what I know about, but the emotions are similar. And your loved one, furthermore, might not have Alzheimer's. They might, like my dad, have vascular dementia, or they might have Lewy body dementia, frontal, frontotemporal lobe dementia, or some of the other various rarer forms of dementia. They might even have a combination of two or more forms of dementia. And I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's disease, again, partly because it's the form of dementia I know best, but also because it's the most common form. And one final caveat. Uh, in the UAE, I understand that you're going to have carers to help you care for your loved ones. We have the same in the UK, but not until the very latest stages. Uh, and it's going to be hugely important for you to be aware of the situation faced by those who are caring for your loved ones. If they're to do the best job possible, they need your support and your understanding. I should imagine that in the UAE, as in the UK, People are usually in denial for some years before a diagnosis of dementia. It's just old age, we tell ourselves. Uh, or they're just getting older. Of course they're forgetting things. But underneath the supposedly reassuring thoughts and our comforting words lies the same dread. 
and the same feeling of the bottom falling out of our world, life is never going to be the same again. So I don't think the fact that you have servants, and we don't, matters. I don't think the fact that you have drivers, and we don't, matters. I think the only thing that matters for both of us is that our loved ones live as full, happy, and satisfying a life as possible, even if they have dementia. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, how you can help your loved one live as full, happy, and satisfying life as possible, despite their dementia. So some of you will have heard that Alzheimer's disease has seven stages. The denial that I've just talked about, you know, when you're saying it's just old age or whatever, happens until about stage three. It's at stage three, in my opinion, that Alzheimer's disease becomes impossible to ignore. And I'll collapse the other three, like the other stages, into just three, mild, moderate, and severe. And in each case, I'm going to talk about the symptoms common to this stage, and I'll also say something about how you might help somebody at that stage live as well as possible. And throughout, I'm going to talk about my own experiences with my mum. Um, and it's important to remember, I need to say this, um, everyone is different. Your loved one may show these signs earlier or later, or indeed not at all. Um, everyone is different. Okay, so I'm going to talk first about mild dementia, and I've got my crib sheets here. Um, this is mum in the stage of mild dementia. We, we had great fun when she first came to live with me. Um, I'm a lecturer. I lecture for the University of Oxford in philosophy, and mum used to come to my lectures, and she'd sit in the front row here, and as I talked, she'd nod and smile, and actually every lecturer wants in the front row somebody who's nodding and smiling. Listen to this, everyone in the front row. Nodding and smiling, and, and because it was just so nice to have my mum sitting there doing all this. And as you can see, she was still very happy. She used to lean over and kiss me and say, oh, I love living with you. Um, and it, it was really nice. Uh, so that's her with one of her great-grandchildren. That's her with a friend, that's someone her with a grandchild, that's me. Okay, so a person with mild dementia, these are all the symptoms. Um, I mean, again, you can look at those, you've, you've got those in your pack. Um, but for example, mum used to, she didn't recognise anyone. Um, I mean, she still recognised her family at that time, but you'd come to the door, you'd knock on the door, she wouldn't know who you were, and she'd say, I love your dress, what a beautiful dress. And of course, people would forget that she didn't know who they were. Um, why, would you think, why would you worry about that when somebody's being so nice to you? Um, she also, uh, she'd go to the shops, and I discovered shortly after this started happening um, that actually she owed every shop in the village money because she didn't, like handing it, she was always a bit mean, my mum, and she'd put the money away uh, in her purse or something and not take it out, and she'd say, oh dear, I've forgotten my money. And you can't not give an old lady her bit of whatever she's bought, so she would get whatever she'd bought, and she owed the money. Um, and I, I eventually started going around giving the money to all the shopkeepers so she could just take whatever she wanted. Um, little bit, so she hid money everywhere. I used to find it all over the place. She'd insist that she'd washed and dressed um, in new clothes that day, and it was obvious that she hadn't. And she'd always been very particular about things like that, so it was very odd for me um, to find her obviously not clean. Um, and very distressing, it would have been very distressing for her. Um, she also started to get a bit paranoid. Um, so my younger brother, um, she used to think that he was stealing from her. Now, he wasn't stealing from her. He would never steal from her, but she thought he was. Um, and that was very distressing for him, as you can imagine. Um, so that's what the symptoms are. And I know um, we're going to talk about the symptoms later. Um, let's talk a bit about how to help people with mild dementia. Um, I've got to hear, listen to their stories. Okay, all of you have this feeling. Your parents tell stories, don't they? And as they start the story, you think, oh, heard this one before. 
okay, and you, you hear it, but you don't listen. I was like that. And oh, I'm so sorry now, because I wish I had really listened instead of just letting it go in through one ear and out through the other. Because actually, of course, those stories stopped quite soon after this. And it was a really sad thing. I mean, I used to say to mum, you've just told that one, mum. And one day she just stopped. And that was so sad. Um, there were other little things. Truth, understanding truth creatively. Um, I w came down one day and found mum with her hat and coat on, about to go out. And she, uh, she said she was going to find daddy. And I said, oh, but mum, daddy's been dead for some years now. And her face crumpled and she started to cry. And I thought, why did I do that? You know, why couldn't I just... And from then on, every time she went out to look for daddy, I, I would say, I'll come with you, and we'd go around the block. And by the time we'd gone around the block, she had stopped thinking about daddy. So I didn't have to tell her again that he'd died, um, and that was a relief. Um, things like promises. Um, I promised when I was moving her from her house to my house, I promised her I wouldn't throw away any of her stuff without asking her. I didn't at that stage know that she had kept everything that had ever come into that house, including every thing, every can that she'd washed and put away very carefully in case it ever became useful or something like that. It was completely impossible to keep my promise to her. And I like telling the truth. I don't like breaking promises, but, but actually I had to. And I wished I'd never um, made the promise in the first place. And at this point, you can still make records. Take out those family photographs. Go through it with them and, and actually caption them all. I wish I'd done that, because at one point, Mum would have been able to tell me who these strange people were. Um, and, and very quickly, she wasn't able to tell me. She had no more idea than I did. So that's uh, mild dementia. Um, getting on to moderate dementia, um, I told you, in the beginning, it was lovely living with Mum. Uh, she enjoyed it, I enjoyed it, we went to the ballet, we went to the opera, we, we did things together. Um, at this stage, it was getting very difficult. Um, these are the sort of symptoms that you'd have, expect with somebody with mild dementia, uh, moderate dementia. Um, Mum, who had always been beautifully dressed and had always cared about having her handbag matching her shoes and things like that, I always remember her sister saying, your mother's the sort of person who likes her handbag to match her shoes, as if that was a terrible thing. But mum did like her handbag to match her shoes. I remember one day she got up and she was wearing um, a peacock blue top with red trousers and socks pulled up over the trousers. And I thought, oh, she would hate to see herself. But actually, you can't think like that with dementia. You've, just, you've got to go with the person at the moment. Um, looking after her, the money, she had a twist of money that she kept in her drawer right up till the day she left my house. Um, that was her running away money. She always used to tell her daughters to keep running away money in case they ever had to go away. And I think that little bit of money, it was only about 50 pence, um, was her running away money. Um, it became impossible to occupy her. She used to do lovely embroidery and she used to like reading the paper and books. And at first, she couldn't read books anymore because, of course, the story just didn't stay in her mind. Uh, she couldn't watch the television anymore because she used to completely misunderstand what was going on. Um, and she used to do and redo and redo her embroidery. And it would go, she'd then unpick it and she'd say, I'm so stupid, I can't do this, I can't get this right. And that hurt me when she talked about being stupid. And, eventually, and I also got very sick of threading needles for her. Um, and eventually, I just picked it up and put it in the attic, and we never mentioned it again. But she didn't have anything to do. Um, and, and that was very, very difficult. Um, and say safety. Um, I mean, it, she was so used to turning the gas on that I had to get a, 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 um, a safety valve put on the gas stove so that if she turned it on, actually no gas would come out. Um, so, 
looking at how to help a person with moderate dementia, um, one of the first things you should do, I think, is stop asking questions. Um, people would ask mum questions, very simple questions, like, where did you live before you came to live with Marianne? And mum was very good at, she had strategies by which to, to head people off from questions. She'd say, oh, I can't remember my, my mind so f I'm so old that I've got so many memories that they're falling out of the back of my head, she'd say, ask my daughter. And they would ask me and I'd tell them, but she couldn't remember, that's why she was saying this. Um, so, so it's recommended by another author, somebody called Oliver James in England, that, that you shouldn't ask questions. That's very, very difficult. Um, because actually one of our ways of interacting with each other as human beings is to ask questions, to show an interest in the other person. And with a person with dementia, showing that interest automatically wrong-foots them. Because you ask a question that they should be able to answer, and they know they should be able to answer it, but they can't. And think how you would feel if, if you were asked a question that you should be able to answer, but you can't. Um, so, if you can train yourself to stop asking questions, that's, that's a very good thing. Um, stop hurrying. When mum was living with me, um, I felt like a cartoon character. You know those cartoons with Tom and Jerry, where the, somebody's running like that, and then they slow down like that for a short period, and then they rush again. I was like that with mum, because I'd rush, 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 because I was working full-time all the time she lived with me. Um, but I couldn't do hurry with mum. Uh, since I was in her presence, I had to move very slowly, talk very slowly, and as you can hear, I talk quite fast. Um, so this was difficult. Um, don't criticise, correct, contradict, or scold. Um, you probably never do that with your mum. You never tell, you know, say that she shouldn't be doing this or, or doing that or something. Um, I'm afraid I fell into that a little bit um, when she was living with me. Um, and the important thing is that somebody with dementia may not have a cognitive memory. They don't know who you are, um, but they do have an emotional memory. And if they've had a bad experience in the morning, this will carry with them for the rest of the day, um, even if the rest of the day has gone okay. And they don't know why they're upset, but they are upset. Um, much better to try not to do that. Um, one of the things I did was, was try imagining the world from their perspective. And with the, um, the book that I've written, I've got one of the entries in it is where I try to imagine what it's like to be mum, waking up in a bedroom she doesn't recognize, covered of photographs of people that she thinks she ought to recognize, but doesn't, wondering whether she should get up or not, uh, wondering whether those clothes are hers or not. And mum used to come out of her bedroom going, hello, hello, because she didn't know where she was. And so I'd bowl up and say, morning, mum. Um, and she'd think, I could see her thinking, I know this woman, I think, <laughs> but she didn't know who I was really either. Um, now, can you imagine how awful that must feel? Um, and I think trying to imagine yourself into their position is, is um, a very good thing to do. Um, be physically affectionate. Different people like different levels of physical affection. My mum was very physically affectionate and she'd love me to hug her and so on. If, if your loved one doesn't like quite that, they might like a touch on the hand or, or something. Um, just, just to make a connection between the two of you, because so many connections are just disappearing. Um, uh, singing uh, or reciting poetry, I understand that reciting poetry is very important in your culture. In my culture, singing is very important. And mum and I would do the washing up or something together and we'd sing, and we'd sing some of the songs from the war. Um, and she could always remember the words of those. It was interesting. She'd forgotten almost everything else, but she could remember the words of those. And she remembered the words of prayers. And she remembered the words of poetry that she had learned as a girl. Uh, and that is some, it, that's a really nice thing to do with someone. Um, 
That's moderate dementia. We're going on now to severe or end-stage dementia. That's tough. I'm not going to hide it from you. It's really tough. Uh, I mean, at this point, somebody starts to lose just about everything. They don't stop being themselves, funnily enough, because that emotional memory is still very important. But uh, they might change their sleep patterns, have no sense of time. I mean, mum would sundown, is the technical term for it. Um, so as the sun went down, she'd get frightened. And I lose track of the number of times she told me that the world was coming to an end. Did I realize that the world was coming to an end? Because it was getting dark outside. And I'd, just, I'd say, oh, mum, don't worry, it's just it's night time. But she'd lost the sense of night time. It was just getting dark outside, and she didn't like it, especially in winter, where in England it gets dark at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, Compulsive, repetitive behavior. Mum used to roll up handkerchiefs. She'd take a handkerchief out of her sleeve and she'd fold it into two, fold it into four, fold it into two again, and carry on doing it. And then she'd thrust the bundle at me so I could secure it. Um, and it was just I got used to it. But people seeing it for the first time would find it really quite difficult. Um, Fail to recognize even their nearest or dearest. I have a lovely memory of my younger brother coming in and mum throwing her arms around his neck and saying, I don't know who he is, but I know I love him. Well, that's nice, isn't it? So, uh, but she didn't know who he was. Uh, and she actually never stopped recognizing me, but she didn't know who I was. Uh, she called me mum, in fact. And I was quite pleased with that because it seemed to me that it meant that she felt secure and that's what I wanted her to feel. Um, this change, well, change in personality and things like that, I'll tell you just quickly about a time when I was kneeling by the bed, helping her put her socks on. And I looked up at her just as she intentionally kicked me in the face. And I could see the intention there, and I was so, so angry. Um, I was going to hit her. And I, I had to go out of the room and slam the door and not go back in until I'd calmed down a little bit. Because here I was, getting up four times a night with her, putting my life on hold for her and so on. And I was happy to do all this. Uh, I wasn't doing it for payment, if you like. But what she was paying me with was a kick in the face. And I think as a carer, especially in the UK where you're doing it all yourself, um, you've got to learn to forgive yourself um, because you're going to feel angry and everyone will tell you it's the disease, not the person. Um, but your emotions count too and it's very difficult to, to feel like that. So what to do with a person with severe dementia? How to help them? Um, well, I think this continue to be physically affectionate, as much physical affection as they'll accept from you. And with mum, I used to hug her all the time because that made her feel good. Uh, and I think singing, reciting poetry, very important because that's the sort of thing people remember and it makes them feel good to remember. I used picture books. I used to get cheap picture books for children and we'd sit there and go over and she'd just say, ooh, lovely. Um, you know, it might be an animal or sunset or something like that. And I complimented her and praised her all the time. You're beautiful. You know, aren't you clever? Things like that. I, I think that helps. Um, some women are like dolls. Um, I don't know whether men do. I've never seen a man holding a doll like that, but some women find that very comforting. You might think about that. It didn't work with mum. <laughs> she never was very like that. Um, so, two weeks before mum's death, she looked at me, she'd, by that time she'd doubly incontinent and she'd lost her language largely. Um, I went in and she looked at me and she said completely lucidly and she looked me in the eye and she said, you're a lovely person, sweetie pie. And she touched me on the cheek and I, it still sends shivers down my back when I think about that. And two weeks later, she died. And I'm going to go back to my script now. Um, uh, 
This was the 9th of April, 2009. And her death was very unexpected. Um, I was called into the home. I rushed in. But thankfully, I, I was with her. Uh, I was holding her in my arms and telling her she was beautiful. And she looked so peaceful. Um, and from that point on, my caring days were over. And I was determined to use my experience to help other people in the same situation. And for the last three years of Mum's life, I'd been writing a blog for something called Saga magazine online. And I described my life with Mum. Uh, and I shared my frustration, my anger, my fear, and most of all, my love for her. And the blog attracted thousands of readers who told me that they were laughing and crying with me. And I liked the fact they were laughing and crying. Um, and for me, the blog was hugely therapeutic. And after Mum died, I made the blog into a book, this book, and I've got one to wave at you. Um, but you've actually got the guts of the book in the little booklet that the Foundation has prepared for you. Um, but that's my mum again. Lovely picture, isn't it? Um, it's sad when you think about it. This book has been selling really well, and that is sad, isn't it? And I get lots of emails from carers who want to share their pain, their frustration, their fear, and their sadness. And I thought you might be interested in a couple of extracts from emails. Um, and I'll read them out because I, I know by email the people who wrote them. Um, so Sue wrote, she laid her head on my shoulder in the back of the car, bless her heart, and said, are we going home? Please take me home. It's awful, so awful, I just want it to be over. I can't bear my lovely, dignified mum having to go through this. That was Sue. And Josie wrote, she knew who I was, and for 20 or 30 minutes, she pleaded with me not to let her die. I eventually calmed her down by doing her hair when she'd allow me to touch her. I'm stressed and I feel so bloody useless. And so many carers feel that, stress, definitely but they also feel useless when, in fact, they're doing everything they can. So I try to talk about dementia and caring for somebody with dementia whenever I can. I've spoken in England at our Houses of Parliament, both the Lords and the Commons, at the conferences for our big political parties, and at many venues around the UK, and now I've spoken in Abu Dhabi. Woo. Um, Carers UK have made me a national ambassador, and I'm a national ambassador also for Alzheimer's Research UK and a carer's champion for Age UK uh, in Oxford. Um, dementia is a terrible thing. We must beat this disease. Until we do, we're going to have to care for the people who've got it. And I hope I've convinced you of the importance of this and of the importance of caring for the carers of those with dementia. So, in common with the rest of the world, the UAE is expecting a dementia time bomb. I, Mira mentioned this earlier. Uh, I understand that 25 to 30 percent of those over 50 amongst you have diabetes. This suggests that for you, coping with dementia may be even worse than it is for those in the UK. And for this reason, I think it's wonderful that you're having this Muntada. Uh, a forum in which you're coming together to discuss the future and how you're going to cope with the dementia time bomb when it hits you. And it's wonderful that the Foundation is doing everything it can for Alzheimer's awareness and to advance scientific research uh, and preventing and treating Alzheimer's. Okay, I wish you all the best in the world. If I can help those of you who are caring for or will care for somebody with dementia, I'll do whatever I can. Thank you.